shoes and hope the tongues don't have it damaged. Periodically, tongues need the rivets changing. Okay, or you can buy a new pair, I don't care. But you need good fitting tongs. So if you don't have good fitting tongs, the first thing you do, you grip the shoes in inappropriate places, you grip too tight, and you lose any finesse that you might have. So I'm very fussy that I have tongs that fit. Okay? I like a parallel grip on the top of the shoe. I like a parallel, parallel grip on my tongs. That way, I don't need to grip very tight, okay? When I hold my shoe, I always hold my shoes in the direction that I'm working. So if I was working the toe, my tongs face the toe. If I work my branch, my tongs work, face the branch. And as I get to the heel quarter, I let it slip, and my tongs face where that shoe's going, okay? So you'll see it in the handmaids, but I hold it where the shoe's going. Not where it is, because that's where the branch is. I'll let my tongue slip, sorry, this way. So can you see now I've got a good posture? Okay, so I can hit here, okay? I can hit there, I don't have to move much. So tongue position's extremely, extremely important. Because when I shoe horses, one thing I've got to do is cooperate with the horse. I might have to get myself a bit uncomfortable to get under the horse, whatever. When I'm over here, this is going to cooperate with me. Okay? It doesn't have an opinion. The horse has an opinion. So, tongue, tongue position is really, really important. How many times have you seen people dub the toe, shoe with that toe now? So, I'll hold it there. I want to bend the heel in. Look how I have to stand. Does that look comfortable? Or if I kick my tongs in exactly the same place and rotate them, does that look better? Okay. I'm always repositioning my tongs. Constant reposition, reposition. Okay. Because good tongue position will make me effective. Things that I know. When I'm finished, fit shape in the shoe. The toenail and the center of the heel should line up somewhere close. Okay, somewhere close. If you don't trust that, go to your old scrap pile. And you'll find your scrap pile will come pretty close to that. Okay. Toenail and the heel line up. And you'll do it by accident. Or 14 trips to the anvil. Okay. We don't want to do that. What is the one piece of information you need to know when you go to shape that shoe? Well, two pieces. One, you've got the right size shoe. And two, the width of the foot. If you know how wide that foot is, and then you get the toenail and the heels to line up, it will pretty much fit the first time. So it's avoiding trips to the horse. That's the most inappropriate thing. So measure the width of the foot. Measure the width of the foot. 
say, oh, I guess it. I could be pretty close. Well, four and an eighth is four and an eighth. It's not four inches. So you just walked over to that horse with a four inch white shoe. You're going to walk back and you're going to make it four and an eighth. If you don't measure it, you're going to make it four and three eighths. And then you're going to walk back again. If you just like walking around and you see it all the time with people at certification, don't have any trips to the horse with the left front. They've got to the right foot, yes. So it's always good to measure. Nothing wrong, no shame. If you're, if you're around me much, you'll find my, my ruler lives in my back pocket. Okay? Where it lives. Okay. I've got the two front shoes in the fire. I can't remember where I put the front and the hind in. Give me a second, let me pull that out. I'm going to get it right. Uh, that's the front. So, that's the hind there waiting. So, I'm going to make a hind out of this front. So, all I'm going to do, my tongs are facing in the direction of the branch, I'm going to tighten my toe quarter. I'll bring it back to where I want the quarters. Straighten the toe quarter out. Widening the branch. I need, I need a fuller. I always stop my fuller in opposite the corner of the heel. That way they stay with me. Whoop, too far then. difference to the size of the bearing surface just by double fullering it. Okay. So that's one of my most common hind shoe modifications. My front shoes, I roll the toe. Now, look where my hand is. It's below the level of the end though. I get into it. If you've got your hammer up here, you won't get as dramatic a thing as, as roll. But I hit into it. And I go down the outside branch. I'll start the wheel. And I'll side on the outside edge. visualizing what a toe bend needs to look like. I think a lot of us do, okay? So what we need is a template. It's not a template, it's a shoe's template. Because that's the shape that I want to make. So if I take the shape of the foot that I want, I take this shoe and I mark the second nail hole. Okay, mark the second nail hole. And then on the shoe, from the middle of the toenail to the outside edge of the heel nail, I put a line. From the middle of the toenail to the outside edge of the heel nail, I put a line. 
Now put it on the end of. On the second nail hole, the second nail hole, I put a line parallel, inside and outside. And here, I put a line parallel to the line on the shoe. And this one here is out here somewhere. I take the shoe away, parallel to that line, I fill in my branches. And that's the toe bend for that shoe. Okay, and if I put a dot at the back of the edge of the toe, when I'm finished, this heel has got to line up with that toe now. That one finished with that toe now, okay? And so, it's how to make a tape something to copy. If you use a permanent marker, that won't come off immediately. Then you do the hind shoe, it's slightly different. The hind shoe, over there. With the hind shoe, is slightly different. You move between the first and second nail hole, not the second nail hole, but between the first and second. Permanent. Ah, permanent marker, that's better. Probably yours. Already stolen it. <laughs> Um, center of the toenail to the outside edge of the heel now. Center of the toenail to the outside edge of the heel now. And I put that on the angle. And I go from 1.5 to 1.5, 1.5 to 1.5. I put a line out here parallel to that line. Same on that side. I remove the shoe, power to that. And that's the toe bend for that shape. Okay? And so now I've got something to copy. Okay, because we all need to copy a little bit. I'll put that over here for a minute. I need a pair of 3 8 tongs. Let's put the steel in the fire. I just want to talk about one more thing. Who stole the steel? Okay. Anybody ever make a shoe for the wrong side? Okay. I'm going to give you a rule, not a guideline. So guidelines are a bit... Rules are very German. So... <laughs> When I put my steel on the end belt, doesn't matter whether it's a roadster or whatever, I put the outside heel away from me. So that's gonna be outside heel. When I mark my steel, I always mark it to the outside edge. Okay, so when you bend the toe, the mark's on the outside edge. So, I've marked the outside, I've marked the outside heel. Then I visualize a line down the center. If the mark is to the right of center, it's a right shoe. If the mark's to the left of center, it's a left shoe. That's not a guideline, that's a rule. But that's there. And you see, that's going to bend like this. That's going to be the outside heel. It's going to be a right shoe. So as soon as you put it in the end belt, it always goes outside branch away from me. Visualize a line down the center. Mark to the left, to the left. Mark to the right, to the right. Mark to the left, to the left. It's not a guideline. That's a roadster. That's whatever. It doesn't matter. Okay? So you shouldn't make them for the wrong side anymore. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make one half fullered and one half punched. And anybody ever learned a two times table? <coughs> learned it almost like a poem, didn't you, at school? One's two is two, two, two is a four, three, two is a six. Well, I can remember my recipe for fullery. I hem it, I mark it, I full it to 60%. I work the outside edge, I work the garniture, I flatten the hoof side, I flatten the ground side, I pull it to 100%. I stamp it, I level it, I stamp it to the end belt, not into the end belt, to the end belt. I pritchle it, I level it, I pritchle it. I don't break it, unless something goes wrong. Okay, unless something goes wrong, then I gotta make a little correction. And I didn't say flatten it, I said flatten the hoof side, then flatten the ground side, it makes a difference. And I said flatten, not a careful use of words, I didn't say squash. <laughs> okay? 
So I have a method. It's all about having methods, building pieces, being able, if I asked you all to take a shoe off, would I expect you to be all take the shoe off as good as me? Yes, I hope so. Because why are you good at pulling shoes off? Do it the same way every time. Well, if you've got a lot of variety in your forging, you've probably got a lot of variety in the result. I hem it, I mark it, I full of the 60%, I work the outside edge, I work the garniture, I flatten the hoof side, I flatten the ground side, I full of the 100%, I stamp it, I level it, I stamp it to the angle, I pritchle it, I level it, I pritchle it. I should get a good result, okay? Nobody said, what's the garniture? Or does everybody know? I was wondering if I said that. Yeah, you too, Phil, I do ask. What's this edge called from the widest point to the heel? Boxing, yeah? Boxing. Well, garniture is the edge from the toe around to the quarters. It's that dividing line you have between the foot and the shoe, or the shoe and the foot. That, that edge right there, that is called garniture. That's the outside edge. Hemming is working the outside edge, making it narrower and then slight so to compensate for how much the fuller is going to displace, displace the material. Having a fuller, you need several. You need a narrow, a standard, and a wide. Why? It's a matrix. <coughs> what size nail does a wide fuller make? Depends on how thick the steel is. Wide fuller in 516 stock will probably make an MX. A wide fuller in half inch stock will probably make an E10. A standard fuller in half inch stock will make an E8. A narrow fuller in half inch stock will make an E6. So what you have to decide is, what is the thickness of the steel, of what size nail do I want, and then select the fuller, okay, to get what you want. So I'm gonna, this first heat, I'm not gonna rush, I'm not very fast anyway. I'm gonna seat it out, just to widen the stock a little bit, because I'm not gonna bump the toe. And I'm gonna bend the toe, and with the front shoe, let me talk like that. I mark the middle, and on each side of the middle, you can put a little mark on your shoe if you want, in thirds. So 12 inches is perfect, isn't it? You've got six inches, what's one third? Two inches, what's two thirds? Four inches, three thirds is six. With a front shoe, our toe bend starts at two thirds, finishes at two thirds with a toe quarter, just inside one third of one third. So I didn't give you a measurement of two inches, I gave you a proportion. So if the steel was that long, it's still one third. Okay. With a hind shoe, our toe bend starts at one third and finishes at one third, so you get that narrow effect. Okay. So let's make a couple of toe beds, see if I can remember. <coughs> So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to seat it out. So I'll just narrow down. It's clean. It's not lots of hammer mark. It's a feature. Start with two thirds. Look how hard I'm hitting. Overlapping my blow lots and lots of times. Just inside one third. Put my toe forward. Move it. Put my toe forward. Now hold it on the toe quarter and set that toe quarter. Thinking of this angle. Okay. Now I got my angles somewhat close. That one's just been a bit too far. That's these dips will get out. Let's give it a level. Oh, it's not a level, it's a flat. See how little energy I'm using. You can see the surface is getting shiny. Okay. Now on this side I'm going to roll the toe. Which I think that's more important than bumping the toe up. I'm going to mark 
pissed off of my foot ring. Now, my foot ring is going to be just in front of that line, about an eighth of an inch. The other side, my stamping is going to be on the line. The foot ring is in front of the line, so when I make my nail hole, it'll line up with the other nail hole. So, the, can you see what, why I'm, if I, otherwise I'd have a rack toe, wouldn't I? So I'm planning it. Now I use a starter stamp. What is a starter stamp? It's a normal stamp, but it has a pyramid point. Why? Well, a pyramid point in chamfered corners will penetrate much easier than something with a flat end. So what will you get? Less distortion. So this tool will penetrate easier, cause less distortion. So I can produce 60% of my nail hole with my starter stamp. So my finishing stamp has only got to tweak it. It doesn't have to take the abuse. So I use a two stamp process, a starter and a main. Okay, put that in my pocket. To make life easier, I'm gonna cool out half of each branch. So localize the heat. Okay? Localizing the heat will make it easier for me to make it a, a, a narrower toe bed, don't it? So I don't want it to turn into a front shoe. So the first thing I'll do, nice clean line. One third, I'm across the toe, to one third. People expect me to be really strong. What do you see with my origin? Lots of little hits. Now, as I hit this, I, the most important part of this operation is to push down the resistance I do. That's what makes it bend. The hammer only travels the same distance every time. Turn it. my toe. Now, look at the polish. I could hit this three times, but I don't want to hit it three times. I hit it a lot of times. You see the polish going onto the surface. Almost looks like a wire brushed it. Oh, look at the shine on it. Well, I love it in a competition where you see young people wire brushing like crazy. Gives old people a chance to get ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you can take 15 minutes while I brush it. I'd soon have 10 minutes for you. Probably more useful. Okay, my following will be just in front of the line. And my nail hole will be just on the line. come from? Me or the anvil? The anvil. Look how long I can do that. What am I doing? I'm containing the ricochet. Okay, so the energy is I use it to my advantage. A lot of my forging, I use the anvil. So you notice how high I'm picking the hammer up. trying to get perfect heels. I want to make a good heel. So I want to wrap, hot rasp it a little bit. But I want a good heel. So I'll be good. But I want little effort. And then when I bend my branch, I want to bend it with no effort. So it's going to take tongue position, position on the horn, so it takes no effort. So I'll forge my heel. Make sure I do the right one first. Set my horn. I knock the top corner off. What was that? Three hits. Now, I put my heel check on. Okay, that. Tongue 
horse now where are they facing? <coughs> where the branch would like to go. Put it on the horn, you see it fits from the, the toenail to the quarters. My hammer blow travels the same distance every time. The tongs didn't travel very far. It's a bit too much, okay? There you are, you can see, I've got my lining up. Now, what's the next step? Hem it. And then play this again. And we're going to outside edge, up the hill, on the hill, and down the hill. Up the hill, on the hill, down the hill. I didn't rush. Now I'm marking. shaping because my toe was the right shape. If it fits on the horn, I just bend the heel a little bit. It was the right shape. I'm just going to flatten the heel out now. It's got that little lump on it. And then I'll box it off. So I put very little effort into the heel, but it's good. Yeah. There we are. Not bad. Hammer finished heel for 10 blows. So, my following method. I've hemmed it and I've marked it. What's next? Full up to 60% of the finish step. Then work the frog eye. Then work the garniture, then full it to 100%, then stamp it, then level it, then stamp it to the emerald, then pritchel it, then level it, then pritchel it. And it should be done. It's a recipe. So watch the heel again. trouble. When they bend the branch, the toe quarter changes shape. So to help that, I'm going to hold it in the toe quarter. And I see where my tongs are. They're facing where that branch is going to go. So now, half in between the toe and the ear. So by holding it there, I protected the shape. It doesn't turn into a front shoe. A lot of time we have trouble with turning them into front shoes. It's thickened up the heel, so I'm just going to give it a little pattern. Now uh, hemming it. When I hem, I visualize three lines on the horn. A center line. Center line, and a line three-eighths of an inch each side of the center. For me, this is uphill. That's on the hill, and that's down the hill. When I hold my shoe, Uphill, that's on the hill, that's down the hill. So when I do my hemming, instead of just using the top of the horn, which will turn things into circles, I go up the hill, on the hill, and down the hill. So I go up the hill, on the hill, and that helps emphasize the shape. Now I mark the flooring. Side, like the ground side, pull it 100%, stamp it, level it, stamp it to the anvil, bridge it, level it, bridge it. I'll get you all brainwashed. Did you write that down? Huh? I said, could you write that down? Yeah, I do write it down. You guys should be writing it down. So, I don't hit it too hard. It's a bit like the Roy Bloom thing. 
Anybody seen Roy Bloom get laying for cow shit? If you hit it too hard, it will flow wider. What's next? Frog eye. Up the hill. Down the hill. Down the hill. Down the hill. Up the hill. Down the hill. I don't need to go any further because that's going to become boxing. Now I flatten the hoose side. Look at the shiny things on it. Flattened it, not squashed it. Now look at the shine starting this side. Now I'm going to finish the shine off. Now I forward to 100%. bulges back in. So now I stamp to the end though and it tightens the material at the bottom of the punch. It compresses it. And then Uh, 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 uh,
size, but I can, I can regulate the size of my nail by how deep I go. The punch I'm using is a, a, a plain punch for an E head. But because I'm controlling the depth that I go, I'm putting the MX nail in it. Because the angles on the MX are the same as on the E head. So I don't go for nails for every size. I just have nails for a family. Unless I get into like draft shoes, then I have to have an exercise punch up. But this is just a, this, this punch is actually set up for E4, E5. And I'm putting MXs in quite comfortably. And it, 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 it's, it's the decision we're making with, with, with the depth that we go. We can regulate it. What I'm going to do now with the next one, plain stamps, I'm going to stamp it. It's like a method, a recipe. And it's a recipe very, very similar to my full ring recipe. I mark it. I orientate the punch to make sure it's in line with the shoe. I stamp the 60%. I work the outside edge. I work the garniture. I wonder which side I'm going to hit now. Flatten the hoof side. I'm going to flatten the ground side. And a stamp to 100%. Oh, now we're back. It's the first stamping is to com compensate for the fuller. Now I'm going to stamp to 100%. I level it. What's next? I stamp to the anvil. I perch it, I level, I perch on. So we'll do that again. I mark it. I stamp to 60%. I work the outside edge. I work the garniture. I flatten the hoof side. I flatten the ground side. I stamp to 100%. I level it. I Stamp to the anvil, I pritchle it, I level it, I pritchle it. Very similar method. It's easy to remember then. It's a bit like going from a two times table to the three times table. Process. 
towards the heel. Heel check. Tongue on the toenail facing where the branch is going to go. certification you got to this stage and you fitted it and you go and put your nails in and they won't fit and you spend the next 10 minutes cleaning the nail holes out by the time you finish the cleaning the nails hole out you've got to go and fit it again it doesn't fit anymore make sure your tools are set up and you have a method you can see all my nail holes fit they're not 90 percent fits but they're 80 percent fits do you know what? The guys going to certification, do you know what 80% means? You don't fail. That's all the exams are about is don't fail. Okay? Then a few of you will be excellent students and you're going to get 95% anyway. But so it didn't work fast. What I do have is method. And it doesn't matter whether it's a roadster or a bar shoe, it doesn't matter. I have a method. And then, if something goes wrong, I just gotta fix one little bit of my method and then go back to normal, okay? Without a method, without you being able to write it down. So, some of you have been students, haven't you? And for theory, you'll have method cards and you'll write your theory down on flashcards, yeah? Anybody use flashcards, you know what I mean? Well, you should have a flashcard for every shoe you ever make, each time. So you need a flashcard for a toe bend. And one day you'll put that flashcard down because you know how to make toe bends, but you've got that flashcard to go back to. And you've got a flashcard on how to forge your heel. Then you might have a flashcard on something like a salmon side bend, one of those weird shoes you see people make. Uh, do you know what? You might learn to make it. You make it 20 times and you get one right, ready for the competition. And you don't have to make it for another 10 years. Do you know what? You've got a flashcard to go back to instead of trying to make another 20 of them. Okay? 
So most people need information. You should have a flashcard. Some of you are going to do certification. How to measure for the foot. Okay? Because what do many people fail on? Shoes that don't fit. The wrong size shoes. Well, you better have a method card, a flash card, for how to measure. Okay? And so don't assume, because we're roughy tufty horseshoers, that we can remember everything. Okay? There's a few people have written something down today. Most of you haven't. Go home and yeah, tonight write down three things. Only three. Three things that you might have thought about at the clinic. Okay? Because you've got to make the clinic productive. And writing down three things. That, that's a good start. For some of us that are just now building shoes, do you have any advice for that final Stand to the angle, not wrecking your tools. Listening and feeling. And you will fit and screw up screw a few up. But 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 me describing what you what what you watch other people have experienced doing, you think they're hitting it hard, so you think you have to hit it hard. I've described what I'm feeling. I'm stamping to the anvil. But most people then interpret that as He's hitting it hard, and you drive your punch into the anvil, and the next thing you know, you've got a, a wad, wadded up punch, okay? I'm stamping to the anvil. I'm compressing the material at the bottom of the punch, so my pritchel, you notice I'm pritcheling quite cold, because the, pr the material is brittle. So I've, st I've stamped to 60%, then I've done me a little bit, then I've stamped to 100%. But when you look at the on the back side and you stamp to 100 percent you see little bulges okay where the nail holes are if you flatten those in and then stamp to the anvil what you do you compress the material at the bottom of the nail hole and by compressing that material even though it's cold i can stamp a roadster out very cold because i compress the material so it's like brittle and it comes out really easy and so it, it, it's for me it's for us to try and understand what we're trying to achieve more. We're not blacksmiths, we're farriers, we're engineers, okay? And so we're, we're engineers. A toe bend is something exact. A nail hole is exact. If you ask a blacksmith to make a shoe, they can be extremely skilled blacksmiths, but they're not farrier engineers. So they'll have the toe quarters in the wrong place. They'll have the nail holes in the wrong place. They'll have they won't realize, you know, there's a lot to a good portion. So you've got to now go back and reanalyze, okay? What is my full range? Do I really have, and that's the question you ask yourself, do I really, really have a very, very strong recipe for my basic fullering? Okay, I have a very strong recipe, okay? I, I don't make shoes very often at all. But I don't care what I have to make because I can make it. There's only two types of shoe. What are they? <laughs> but, fronts and hinds. <laughs> then there's two ways to put nail holes in them. You can either full of them and stamp them, or you can stamp them. So I've got to learn two types of thing. I've got to be able to weld. So if I need to join the heels together. I've got to be able to bump up. Or I've got to be able to draw down. I've got to be able to create lumps without cracks, because that's what a heel cork is. It's a lump without a crack at the base of it. I've got to be able to make lumps. With that lump, I can make it into any shape I want, okay? And if you start thinking logically at it, you'll, be, you'll get on a lot quicker. But if every time you go to a new shoe, you go to a competition, you see a new shoe, and it's a bit of a different shape, you've got to say, whoa, I've shot on that shape. All that is is a slightly <coughs> wider toe bend, but the heel's bending more, okay? instead of going at it like it's an adventure. <coughs> All my stuff is I'm on a mission. If you're on a mission, what does it mean? Sometimes things go wrong on missions, but you can adapt, can't you? And get back onto your mission. A lot of people are going at it like it's an adventure. They don't even know they're wrong. You know, it's just a, a nice journey. But I always feel like everything I do, I try to be on a mission, a mission based. Then I can evaluate my mistakes easier. Because that's definitely mistakes. You're, with, the, with the punches, you, 
your marketing 60, 100, uh, to the ankle. Yeah. Right? Which of those is your starter stance? Or which of those the, is your... The starter takes me down to 60%. Because it's, for, it's formed most of the nail hole. And it's on the same angles as my finishing punch, but it's got this little point on the end of it extra. And it's got chamfered corners, because when it rounded corners, it doesn't cause as much displacement. And then by the time I get to using my finishing punch, my plain stamp, the steel is colder, so then that one forms the corners and forms the, the nail hole, but it doesn't have to take as much abuse as going in there when it's really hot. You notice with some of your stamps, you use them, and they'll t turn almost orange by the time you use them a couple of times because they're taking more time to sink in because they've got a flat end. Okay, and the longer you think about it, you push your hand into a pile of snow or you push your hand into the snow like that, one's going to make a big hole but be resistant, one's going to go in easily. And so, hot steel's the same. And like, that's why I say, you know, like, anybody seen the thing about Roy Bloom playing with cow poo? Yep. Okay, so you gather up your cow poo. You can try this when you get home, right? <laughs> cow poo, big pile of it, make it a nice block. Then you can see that you can make two sizes of hole with, with your fist. Okay, the first time you make the hole, you push your fist into it, and you get a little hole. The second time you put the fist in, you punch it in. I hope one of your brothers are there too. <laughs> you're all going to get covered in cow poop, but the hole's going to be bigger. So even though, so that's why I, I could hit my punches harder, but all they're going to do is distort the material more. So sometimes I've got to go around three times because my steel is too hot at that point, so I've got to go into it lighter. Sometimes I'll go in a bit heavier because my steel has lost some temperature, and I, now I've got to hit it harder. But it, it's knowing that what the effect's going to be. If you do something to really hot steel, hard, you're going to get a lot of displacement. Okay, you can have lunch now. Is it lunchtime? <laughs> it's going to be here shortly. I'll keep working then. I'm not going to break. Um, what should we make? Uh, Bar shoot. <laughs> <laughs> Let's like the coke for you. That's not getting very hot. Or oh, have you got the gas turned down on that? Oh. Okay. We need to get a bit of heat in that. Okay, so let's cut me uh, 15 inches. 14 and a half. Change my mind. 14 and a half. Do I borrow the ruler though? <laughs> So, we need a formula now, because do you know what? What happens when people make bar shoes is, they either end up with the shoe too big and the bar too small, or the bar too wide and not enough shoe. Ooh. So now we need a formula. Ooh, a horrible things formula, is not I? might have to remember it. So, let's go for an easy formula. Can you somebody grab me the whiteboard? I think it's over there somewhere. Yeah. Think about moving outside so people can see better. Yeah, we can do that. Well, let's, let's do this first, and then we'll do it from the right side. When you move outside, you have to run. Yeah, you are you are you on a mission again? Uh, yeah, I'm always on a mission. I'm on a mission. I gotta. I must not miss my flight this evening. Because it's a long way to drive to Minnesota. <laughs> so. We calculate for a foot, is our foot. We gotta take some measurements. And you know the most important word with measuring? Can't see it. Estimate. When you make handmade horseshoes, we take measurements and we estimate what we're gonna cut. Do you know what? He might cut 14, he might cut 15, and they're both right. Because he'll stretch more, he'll bump more. They both fit, but the estimates were right. So what you've got to learn is estimating. So I normally take three measurements to start. A measurement, A measurement, and a B measurement. That's the width. I always take the two longest. 
normally see A plus A. Now I've got to add something to the bend in the shoe. Well, with a plain point shoe, it's going to be more than it with a fuller shoe, isn't it? Well, I'm going to make a plain point shoe. But not all plain point shoes are going to take the same amount of material. Because he's going to bump an inch into his toe, and you're not going to bump anything. So he's going to need an extra inch of steel, in his estimate. Where you don't need it, you're going to roll your toe. So, this number here, the X measurement, variable. If you're plain stamping, it's different to if you're fullering. So if you fuller it, you're going to stretch those branches that quarter an inch each. So you're going to take a half inch off of what would be for a plain stamp. So all these things mean uh, uh, building an estimate. And then I take a C measurement, which is the width of the heels. So I take the two longest plus something, which would probably say one and a half inches on average plus the C measurement. So we come up with a, a gross thing of 14 inches. Okay. Does anybody remember 16.2? What does that represent in the horse industry, 16.2? How tall the horse is. It's an easy one to remember, isn't it? It's dead easy to remember, 16.2. So, 16.2. For every inch, this grows, this grows by a quarter. So this was our 16 inch piece of steel that we've estimated. We'd mark it at two inches each side and that's where we bend our heels and hockey stick it. So, well that's easy, but what about 14 inches or 15 down inches? Well, drop down a quarter. Drop down a quarter. So six, 17 would be two and a quarter. 15 would be one and three quarters, yeah? Can't draw, I can't do it sideways. 14 inches would be one and a half. What did I ask them to cut? 14. 14 and a half. Was it 14 and a half? I asked. 14 and a half. So one and a half, one and three quarters, what's in the middle? One of five eighths. So right now I've got to mark this at one of five eighths. So now I've got a formula. So I mark the middle. Seven and a quarter. And I mark it at one of five eighths. center marking first. My center marks always look like bump punch marks that I can't see. Now, on the outside edge, I put a mark at one of five eighths. Why on the outside edge? Because when I go to bend it, I can see it. If I put it on the side, I can't see it. So if I put it there, I can see it. So let's put that in the fire. Okay, now, scarves. We all know about scarves. So we're making a straight bar, aren't we? Yes. So a straight bar should, <laughs> straight bar should be straight. So a straight bar should be straight. Then we've got our heel quarters. Okay, and what you remember about your scarf on a straight bar, it must be perpendicular to the back. Perpendicular. So there's one, there's one scarf there. I'll take this one away now. now. Can you see that and that have to be perpendicular? Because then, when you do the second one, how much do you have to overlap it? Not very much. Anybody do a scarf like this? How much you got to overlap that to get those points to touch? Then you got a big water material here. What's going to happen to your straightness? Yeah. Or you can go the other way. What if you make a scarf like this?
Once you're gonna overlap it, you get that to touch. A lot. Those things aren't even gonna touch. You're gonna have little things like this at the front. Anybody ever had those? <laughs> so a scarf, yes. <laughs> a scarf must be perpendicular to the back of the shoe. Okay? Now, you only need a little overlap. Oh, and it's easy as a welt. It's a little overlap and a big overlap. So, how we prepare that? So, we're gonna bend our toe. We're gonna to bend our heel to 45 degrees. So that's about what the, the transition from the heel quarter to the heel is, to the bar is, about 45 degrees. Then what we bent over, we're going to hockey stick back in about one third. One third is a proportion, not a number. So because it's a proportion, it doesn't matter whether it's a big bar shoe with a big piece, or a little bar shoe with a little piece, you drive it back in about one third. You get it back in proportion.
and some of the old fellas will remember what well the oxyacetylene. If you use oxyacetylene, if you don't get the top and the bottom at the same temperature, it's not going to weld. Well, with this, you've got to get the top, the bottom, and the middle the core at the same temperature, and it will weld. Okay? So color, you can weld, you can weld the orange, you can weld the yellow, but if the top and the bottom aren't the same temperature, the color, you're going to struggle. It's equalizing temperature. So I'll bring it out when I'm ready. Two hits on each side just to stick it, and then I'll weld my scarves in. Can I have a look? Every hammer blow shows me where I hit it, where I was jump pushing. It wasn't wild. Did you see anything wild looking about it? Or was it control? And so if you look at that, that's a one hit weld. It could be better. Do you know what? It's not a bad weld. So one hit, good rush. It's better than taking two or three. So yeah, it, 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 what I'm trying to emphasize is a clinic, okay? You're not gonna remember everything, but I've got the retention. That made a lot of sense when you, when you had it, when you first got those two sticks and then you flipped it over, the handle it sucked some of the heat out of there. A lot of the times, I think when I'm doing that, I just hit it, it too you soon. Get too much in a hurry, and that's why I always end up with a bar shoe that has like a, a scarf line in it. And You've it's got, really once you welded that first side, you saw it turn it over, just what Cup said, and I counted to three or four. Let the heat come back into the weld. You can see it too. You, you can know, see you it. Might yeah. not, you might be too much in a hurry to notice it yourself, but when you watch somebody else do it, I really saw that it was like a dark red, and then it just came right back to a, almost orange white. Yeah. So it's not how fast you are. Take a breath. Okay, now it's ready again. Keep going. Yeah, I could improve it with another weld, but I, I, I really wanted to try to do it in one hand because that's what we all would like to do. One of the things I have people do when they learn to weld is um, take old shoes, fold them in half, weld them into new bar stock, forge them out so they look like new bar. Did you ever get to do that? Yeah, you got to do that. <laughs> okay, but what it does, it teaches you how to weld. It teaches you how to forge. It's not, it's not that I want to punish someone, you know, these young men. And, but it was like, it's a core skill. If you learn to weld, 
early in your career, it's much more fun welding. Okay? If welding is something that you feel like is hit and miss, it's not fun. You don't want to do it. But one of the first things I have them do is just take old shoes, fold them in half, draw them back out with new steel, but welding them as they do it. Then they can make, take one and a half shoes and make a new shoe. So they've learned how to weld. They call it pelt making. In the past, that was a skill. People used to come to a workshop like this that shoes a lot of horses, and they'd take all the shoes and they'd spend four days and they'd weld all the sh old shoes up in the steel. Then they'd move on to the next workshop. And that was a man's occupation, was making a new bar stock. So, yeah, it's, it's not a wasted exercise. You also learn how to forge flank by doing it. You get clean ledges, flat lines, parallel, you know. It, it's, it's not, it's not, um, I'm not just going to work, I've got a young person, yeah, I'll, I'll just put him in a corner and we'll forget about him, we'll give him a dirty job to do and forget about it. No, it, the, that job is skill building and he'll never forget how to forge well, how to scrape, scrape bar stuff, clean bar stuff. He, when's that useful? Well, do you know what? The well is useful when you make bar shoes and that ability to clean forge is, a, is good when you want to make a roadster or other, you know, other types of shoes. So it's not giving someone a piece of donkey work. You know, sometimes people feel like they come to a clinic and they spend three hours making pelts. Uh, but it's the skills that those pelts give them. Okay? I don't do it just to get rid of people. It's like they need to learn to swing a hammer. How many people do you see that can't swing a hammer? Well, you're going to be doing a lot of it in this job. And we don't want to ruin our, our wrists and our elbows. And so learning how to... I don't hurt. Okay, I'm built like a tractor, but I don't hurt because I have good technique. And so, to last a lifetime, you know, and I look at some of the girls, you need better technique because you can't do it with durability. Okay? And I don't see why you I've got girlfriends that have done lots of forging. Okay? I've done good, got girlfriends that are competing at a high level. And they're still in their sixties shooting horses every day. They don't hurt. Okay, so it's not because I'm sexist and I look at a little person and think they can't shoot horses. What they've got to do is they've got to bring that next level of smart. Because brute strength and ignorance is not your forte. You're gonna to have to be a bit smarter. And so yeah, you know, and, and so it's like that efficiency with fortune. You might have to go through a little bit of pain to learn it. But it's there for the next 40 years. It's a good tongue position. It's there. It's built in me. When I make shoes, you know, you've seen it always adjusting. Okay, so I'm in a good position. And it's an investment. You know, if you guys were in the, our job, we're so lucky, you know, we start shoeing horses, and we, we, most of us can apprenticeship and do stuff, and we can, we can struggle and make some money all the time. Go to med school. They pay for the political key in there. They don't get paid anything for being there, they just get debt, more debt, more debt. Then they qualify and they pay them like, you know, low. It takes them a long time to get a salary up. So we, we've got the opportunity and we should invest in ourselves when we're, when I say young, but it, new in the industry. Get, build those skills because they're lifetime skills, they're not temporary. Learning to make a roadster. If I made, if you make a roadster, I wouldn't make you make one out of half by one. Why? But I'd make you make it out of half by three quarter. <coughs> because you'll learn the skills and it'll improve your forging for daily. But I don't have to punish you by making you make it out of big steel. Okay? And then so I pick it on you right now. But it could be anybody here, you know? And it's like, so you don't. Okay, one of the things I do is proportionality. Let me show you a picture of a shoe. It goes the other extreme. That shoe there, that's an E3 nail. But it looks like a shoe. The bar shoe. It's all proportionate. That's a skill test. To make it, if you took the nail away, you wouldn't know whether that shoe was that big, that big or that big. But that shoe is that big. Okay, so it, 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 it's all about proportionality. So I don't have to punish you with big steel. I can make you pay attention to detail with little steel. 
okay? And little steel can be harder than big steel because it goes wrong so quickly, you know, okay? So, you know, it's not all about, you know, punishing people, it, it, it's just skill building. Uh, yeah, I, 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 and I still want to skill build, you know, I, I learned to put clogs on in the last 10 years. I learned different techniques for gluing in the last 10 years. Did I need to? Not really, but it's been useful. Uh, I, I use it, so, you know, all these skills are useful, never too late to learn. You've got a long time in front of you. <laughs> okay, you guys can take a break. I'm going to take a break. <laughs>